got here today? I bet you Russell's there first. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> I think he sleeps outside with his knapsack and everything. Hi, Russell. How you doing? <laughs> Whoops. I think he sleeps outside. Brother Littlefield, how you doing? Well, Robert, I'm glad you stopped working on your website. Just point them to mine, it's all done. Much easier. All right, folks, let's start with when I, sur well, we're gonna do when I survey, then we're just gonna get into this message. Sal, why don't you come and pray today? Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning to you online and on Facebook. Let's thank the Lord this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you by our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can be here today and hear the word of God rightly dividing. Lord, we just pray to open our hearts and minds and help us to understand the meaning of our lives while we are on earth. We give you thanks this morning for those that give, the gift and the giver. And in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen.
Well, I have some good news. Well, I think it's good news. That book that is being put together by Kimberly and her team is officially ready. Yeah, it's, she, she did an unbelievable job. I mean, this is, she has, she has sent me what she has done. I'm like, wow, what a great job she did. <laughs> wow. How thick is it? It's about that big. It's a, you're a, ta it's a table version. <laughs> it's, like, it's a coffee table version, you know. No, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a hefty book, but she also made a workbook that goes with it, separate. And uh, the way she did it, oh my, I don't know. This is, uh, it's, beyond, it's beyond wonderful what she has done. That, that's all I can say. And uh, so it's coming out soon. I don't know exactly when, but uh, all of the things that needed to be put in place are now officially in place. And so that's kind of exciting, to be honest with you. So, all right, well, we're just going to, I'm not going to complain about the heat because it's hot all over the country. Now, I can complain about the cold because it's not always cold all over the country. So I can, comp I can focus in on our cold in the winter, but I cannot focus in on our heat because right now it's hot everywhere. Cool it's nice and cool in here right now, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. So, um, all right, so we're going to get going. Hi, welcome everyone on YouTube and everyone on Facebook. And uh, All right, we're going to begin today. I have titled this message, Augustinian Preachers Exposed. And what's the, the purpose for that is that over the last several months, I have received requests from people to go into more detail about exactly what is so dangerous about Augustine and why so many preachers accept his doctrines as though they actually belong to Christendom. So I decided to take a look at him with a closer eye for details and share with you exactly why he is dangerous and why his doctrine on the suffering in an inferno for all eternity not only is wrong, it is also a doctrine of devils, which I will prove next week. And also that it has no rational reason for being accepted by any human being, saved or unsaved. So let me say this at the outset of this message today. Preaching a subject like this can be very boring. If I just laid out a bunch of facts about Augustine, you know, it's kind of difficult. So what I will be doing is I'll be approaching this subject in the only way I know how to make it relevant by including modern day characters, even like myself, and other preachers who preach Augustinian doctrine. And I encourage you to check out what I'm saying. My philosophy of teaching has always been, and you can verify this on YouTube, I have over 600 messages that I have said frequently, don't believe me. Check out what I'm saying in the Word of God and believe that. Especially when you consider this most important of all subjects in the world. See, I want everyone to hear both sides of the story. And I got plenty of people presenting the other side. <laughs> I got pl plenty of people doing that. And I want people to hear both sides of the story. And then you can make an intelligent decision. And I think that that truly is the fair way to, to go because people are not stupid. You give them the information 
and then you let the Word of God be the final authority. Not what I have to say. What saith the Scripture? Not what someone else has to say. What saith the Scripture? Not someone who says, well, that doesn't mean what it says. No, 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 no. Not, I'm not talking about that nonsense. Plenty of preachers are standing up there and I'll go, well, that's not what it says. And then they don't turn around and tell you what it does mean. I'm not talking about that nonsense. I'm talking about people who give you the information and then substantiate and validate with the Scripture, with the Word of God, not their own personal bias. Okay? And you should not necessarily believe, I'm not even going to throw the word necessarily in there, you don't believe doctrine, especially because it was forced upon you as a child, and you think you believe it because you've always believed in eternal conscious torment. What I mean is this, there are people who, they were taught that, so... I think I believe in that, is really the heart attitude that they have. They believe that they believe it, which is a long ways from being firmly settled in it. Because here's the fact, okay? Way deep down inside of your being, you know that you don't really believe it. <laughs> you know you don't really believe that the loved ones who left this earth before you and in your family, in your own life, you know who that is. You can picture them right now. You know that they're not burning and writhing in anguish at this very moment in a burning lake of fire. Somewhere in the deepest recesses of your being, you know. Your knower knows. Which goes beyond a vague intellectual assent to some truth. It goes beyond that. In your most deepest recesses of your being, you know that the God of love has a plan for his creation. Okay, think of this. Everyone listening, think of your family gatherings. I'm not talking about family gatherings last week or even for the last year. I'm talking if you're 60, 70, 80, 90 years old and you happen to be watching this right now. Think about all the family gatherings that you participated in in all of your life since you can remember since you were five years old. Now, I'm sure that is evoking a lot of memories in the hearts and in the minds of all people that, that are listening. So imagine that you're in your younger years and, you know, you were at those gatherings and you remember your grandmother and you remember your grandmother sitting there and she spots her three-year-old grandson. Now this goes beyond the sensation of when you're sitting in a restaurant and a couple walks in, and they're holding a baby, and they walk by your table, and you go, ah, nice baby, and you wave. And then you, you refocus on your table. What your grandmother just experienced is not that. It's not that at all. It goes way, 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 way beyond <coughs> that casual trans transitory meeting that you just had with those people that you don't even know. When your grandmother spotted her three-year-old grandchild who just walked into the room or just walked into the field where you were, there's something on the inside of not just your grandmother, 
but in everyone who watched her response to seeing her grandchild. Right? Something from the depths of your own being just welled up with joy and happiness at the, some, at, at the sight of someone who was so moved at seeing her three-year-old grandchild. You, you felt it with her. You know, you, it affected you. It affected you in the place in your being where you understand and you have peace. It's in that place inside of you that you know God is not the monster that Augustinian preachers make him out to be. It's in there that you know. It's in there that you question whether or not you've been told the truth. I cannot tell you how many people contacted me once I started in the salvation of all who literally said to me, Brother Rodney, I always knew it. I just didn't know who to ask. I knew I couldn't ask my preacher because I knew what he said and what he, and I'm not sure, I'm, I say, I'm saying this now, I'm not sure that he believed what he's, what he's preaching. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty certain a lot of them don't even believe what they're preaching about this subject. That it's nothing but pride that's holding them in this. But, see, that's what I'm speaking of. When I speak of your understanding, it goes beyond this intellect into you, the recesses of your being, what Paul called the bowels of mercy, where when you get nervous, you, you get butterflies here. Your understanding is here. And there are things that preachers say that just don't settle with this part. Oh, here, you, uh, you, can, you hear it and you can, you can chuck it. But then there's this you have to deal with, this part of you, the part that has common sense, <laughs> the part that is rational, understands that a God of love is not about sending his creation to burn for eternity. Not even just to pay for their, their sin, which they can't pay for anyway. I heard another Augustinian preacher this past weekend at a conference mentioning that people pay for their sins as if you could pay for your sin at a grace conference. My goodness, man. What do you think the cross of Jesus Christ was about? I mean, now I just talked intentionally about grandmothers, okay? Now I just did that intentionally because some preachers are accusing, this sounds slow working? Okay. Some preachers accuse me of sh sh speaking about the salvation of all in an emotion. It's all emotionalism, right? There's a preacher two months ago at a grace conference in Chicago who made a big deal about that. He mentioned my name and was saying that everything I taught about the salvation of all was nothing but emotionalism. What he did not know was that the comment that he made was an Augustinian strategy to dissuade people from embracing the salvation of all. <clears throat> now, let me show you what I'm talking about. One of the works of Augustine is called Enchiridion. It's like 55 pages, okay? You can find this in a free PDF online. And you just put in the word E-N-C-H-I-R-I-D-I-O-N and then put the word Augustine after it and put PDF in the Google search. You'll find it. Download that to your computer. And you can read 
some of the things I'll be sharing with you. This is the mind of Augustine right here, okay? And you can do that. You don't have to wait. I'll be quoting a lot of things from this, this book. And you don't have to wait till I do it, because I know some of you, you would like to get ahead and, and, and see what's happening. And well, here's your chance to read about this cycle, Augustine, okay? But it's quite fascinating how distorted this man is. Even scary. Even scary, okay? And he's heralded in Christendom as one of the great fathers of the church. Which is what blows my mind, <laughs> okay? But in chapter 29 of this, this is what he says. It is quite in vain, then, that some indeed, very many, yield to merely human feelings and deplore the notion of the eternal punishment of the damned and their interminable, which means endless, and perpetual, which means forever, misery. They do not believe that such things will be. Not that they would go counter to divine scripture, but yielding to their own human feelings, they soften what seems harsh and give a milder emphasis to statements they believe are meant more to terrify than to express the literal truth. Now, you need to understand, Augustine did not read Greek. He doesn't know anything about the original scriptures that our Bibles come from, okay? He doesn't know anything about this. Now, besides his obvious attempt here at ridiculing those who have human feelings, notice that the salvation of all was the most prominent teaching of his day in the early church right after the death of the apostles for 400 years until Augustine stepped onto the stage of church history, notice what he says, that some, indeed very many, not merely some, but very many, which is an acknowledgement that the salvation of all was the prominent doctrine for the first 400 years of churchianity. <coughs> okay? At the end of this message, I'll tell you what we'll be looking at next week. And this is when, you know, Christianity was new. Some of those men had known the apostles. And so, these were men who taught the salvation of all who understood and read Greek fluently understood that an eon was not for eternity like a certain preacher said, every time the word eon, it's always eternity. Yeah. Well, we taught that that's not true in any way, shape, or form. But these men who taught the salvation of all were not men who would have wanted to disobey the word of God. And then in another place, which I won't put here, but Augustine very condescendingly referred to them as certain tender hearts, even while he's trying to disprove their view of Scripture. Certain tender hearts. So this kind of reasoning that accuses and attacks people who understand the salvation of all and do have a human concern for others and wants the best for others, this is not something new. The preacher who used this in Chicago a couple of months ago is using a tactic that's 1,600 years old. This is not the first time people have done this. But there it is. One of the things that Augustine hated I mean, he despised about these men who taught the salvation of all is that 
they said that God's mercy extends to all beings and that in the end, all will be saved. See, Augustine limited God's mercy to a select few, and this limited mercy, Augustine even extended to babies. Augustine said that if a baby is not baptized, he deserves eternal torments of God's unmitigated judgment. That Augustine taught that. And I know some of your Augustinian preachers also teach that. Now, an atheist does not believe in a God of love. Neither did Augustine. And neither do any Augustinian preachers. They do not believe in an all-loving God. In the upcoming weeks, you're going to read some things. I'm going to read you some things from John Calvin about John, 1 John 4, 8 and 16 that says God is love and his views of what that doesn't mean. Okay? I can't do it all in one message, okay? So you're just going to have to be patient as we work through this. But here's the fact, here's the truth. You cannot have an all-loving God who loves for a while and then turns around and torments his created beings for all eternity. Those two extreme opposites cannot coexist unless God is schizophrenic. I submit to you that the God of the Augustinian doctrine is schizophrenic. He's a sick God. You know, it was God through James who told us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And to accuse God of being both loving and the God of torture at the same time mean, means that you have an unstable, double-minded God. And I refuse, I refuse to believe in your God if you are that Augustinian preacher or one of his people, one of their people. I mean, certainly we can understand the atheist Saying this, if God were truly omnipotent, then he would have the power to prevent all human suffering. And if he were all loving, he would want to exercise that power. But since there clearly is unlimited suffering in the world, then a God who is omnipotent and all loving does not exist. Now, this kind of reasoning certainly makes sense to an atheist. <clears throat> but here's the problem. When we look around in Christendom, we're almost unable to find theologians or preachers who believe in an all-loving God any more than an atheist does. You know, I hear preachers say that God is love, but, uh-oh, uh-oh, watch your butts. When you put a but where God puts a period, you have just acknowledged that you don't believe what God said. Bible does not say God is love, but he's also a just God. Yeah, he is just which is the good news, which people pervert into something terrible. That's good news. He gave me an opportunity to believe, and because he's just going to give your grandfather and your grandmother an opportunity, like me and Kenny were talking about a while ago. 
because he's just, they're getting the same opportunity everybody gets because God is no respecter of persons. That was a good point. <laughs> you see, to them, God is only a God of love towards those who meet his demands or else. Or else. So if theologians and preachers in Christendom all come to the same conclusion as atheists do, we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? How did this happen? And please don't try to convince people who have common sense that the preachers who believe that 95% of God's creatures will spend eternity in a burning inferno, don't try to convince us that you're not thinking like an atheist. We're not stupid. Your people are not stupid. Let me share with you a truth that I learned while I was in the Acts 9 movement. Okay? I learned that we are not Calvinists, known as Calvinism. Calvinism, Calvinists believe in double election. God, before the foundation of the world, chose who would go to heaven, and he chose who would go to hell. And there's nothing that anyone can do to change that. You can't, you can't change it. And when we look around us, and we, around us in the world, and we see how many people have never even heard the gospel, or how many people don't believe the gospel, we can easily calculate that 95% of every person who has ever lived, according to them, according to them, is consigned to God's infernal torture chamber for all eternity. Again, Calvinists do not believe that God is all loving. They do not believe that. Like I said, I'm going to read you something from John Calvin, a student of Augustine. Congratulations. You're going to win the prize. How could God be all loving when they consign 95% of his created beings in God's torture chamber for all eternity? So needless to say, we are not Calvinists. Okay? <laughs> that, that's good news. Then another theological system of biblical interpretation, which was pretty much a knee-jerk reaction to that, is called Arminianism. Arminianism, or Arminianists, believe that God is all-loving, but his redemptive powers are limited or his redemptive capabilities are limited by powers outside of his ability to control. They teach that man's free will will override God's will and God's omnipotence. And so in the Arminian system of theology, man is fully responsible for his salvation. <clears throat> and as a result of that, they also consign 95% of God's creation to burn in his torture chamber for all eternity. So there really is no difference between these two theological systems except one limits the love of God, one does not limit the love of God, But in the end, they both consign 95% of God's created beings to burn in God's torture chamber for all of eternity. Now, approximately 17, 18, 19 years ago, I don't remember exactly what the number is, but I was invited to preach at a grace conference in Pigeon Forge where I met most of the grace preachers that I ended up preaching for the next 16, 17 years with. 
I believe it was the second time we went to Pigeon Forge that Brother Jordan stood up and he explained this. Now, he wasn't talking about the 95%. That was not his point in these two things. In the middle of these two, he put dispensationalism. Okay? And his point was that we are not Calvinists and we are not Arminianists. We are dispensationalists. Well, at that point in my journey in right division, I was excited to learn this. Yeah, brother, we're not part of these two extremes. We are dispensationalists. Finally, I had an answer as to why I was in neither of these two groups. I was happy to know that because there was a time as a Baptist preacher that I had been a Calvinist. Right? And I had taught Calvinism. I had taught predestination, and I taught it this way, that God predestined some to go to heaven, and the others just get what they deserve, and those who get what they deserve have nothing to complain about. That's what I taught. Taught that for a few years. Boy, was I proud to belong to that select group of people who had been predestinated to go that way, and not the other group who were going that way. job, right? You're on the right team, Rodney. Let me tell you, that attitude is just as sick as someone who thinks they're getting rewards because they're passing out a track or they do some sort of righteous act for the Lord. I got news for you. Passing out tracks doing the right thing, are your reasonable service. There is no reward for that. You want to hear a good works-oriented message? Go listen to Brother David Reed's message last Saturday that he preached at Shorewood. Go listen to it. Works. No, you're saved by grace. Oh, salvation is by grace. But everything is based on works. And your rewards are based on works. And that's because they're not rightly dividing Paul's epistles, and therefore they can't understand that sometimes Paul wrote to those who believe that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. They'll never get that part. I assure you they'll never get that. But now that I have grown out of the dispensational box and see the Word of God through the eyes of the salvation of all, now I understand that there is no difference in these three because they all consign 95% of God's creation to burn in God's torture chamber for all of eternity. And the middle group, they also, like Arminians, Arminianists, teach that man's will will override God's will, and God says that he wills, he will have all men to be saved. So dispensationalists are really Arminian dispensationalists. That's the real title. Because basically this is just a hybrid of this. That's all it is. That's all it is. They all teach the same thing, wrapped up in titles, in different titles. You can see, these are just different ways to consign 95% of God's creatures to be burned in God's torture chamber for all eternity. So I ask you, have dispensationalists made any progress over those two other groups? Any progress whatsoever? No, right? Do they have anything to offer that these two groups offer? 
There's absolutely no different except this. Dispensationalists know who Paul is. The other two groups really don't. They know he's in the Bible, but they don't understand his message of grace and his message of the reconciliation of all things and the salvation of all. But even this group isn't understanding that either. So, I'm going to make this smaller. And these are the three major theological systems of biblical interpretation that are found in Christendom. And you belong to one of these at one time, or you still belong to this today. You belong to one of these. Each of them has a hopeless end for 95% of all God's creatures. There was a time when I taught, I thought, I thought those were the only three systems of biblical interpretation. There was a time when that's what I thought. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. There's one more system of biblical interpretation. And after being a believer for 37 years now, 37 years, and having been part of all of these during my journey, the other biblical system of interpretation is the only one that honors God. It is the only one that truly understands the love of God. It is the only one that truly understands the redemptive nature of Almighty God. And they are the only ones who truly understand that His omnipotent power will not allow one of His created beings to burn in a torture chamber for all eternity. And that biblical system of interpretation is the salvation of all. It's the salvation of all. In this biblical understanding, there are no limits to the love of God. Not one. Like Calvinism teaches. In this biblical system of interpretation, God's will will override man's will every time. Man's will will not override God's will like Arminius and Arminian dispensationalists teach. In this system of theological interpretation, no one is burning in a torture chamber for all of eternity like all three of these teach. And it seems to me like they happily teach it. And they're angry that somebody is not teaching it. They're angry. I mean, they're livid. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, of all the systems of biblical interpretation that are on the board right now, the greatest peace that a man or a woman can experience in this life is understanding the salvation of all. It is in understanding the seven words in the Bible that explain God's dealings with mankind and how everything will work out in the end. And those seven words are found in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, that God may be all in all. That is the final state of man. There's a song we used to sing, Wonderful Words of Life. Teach them to me over again, wonderful words of life. Remember that? These are the most wonderful words of life. Because in the final analysis of this whole thing, when everything is done and we are in the eternal state, which the Bible doesn't talk about, the Bible doesn't tell you what it's going to be. The Bible deals in time. Remember that? They de the Bible deals in time. 
and it's temporary. Everything that's in the Bible is temporary except God himself who inhabits eternity. But when everything is done, this verse will be true in every sense of every one of these one-syllable words that God may be all in all. And I will tell you, the saddest thing I have ever seen or experienced since I have been saved is looking at the men I used to preach with doing their best to not only not believe this, but trying to explain it away to their people. Like, this doesn't mean what it says. One of the biggest pitfalls that a pastor, preacher can fall into is to be deceived into thinking that the people sitting in front of him believe everything he says because he's saying it. You know, in the age that we have entered into, just like in the past 15 years, the Google age, right? The internet age, where people can Google anything on the spot and know something right now that they didn't know 10 seconds ago. Like that, like that. So for any man to think that his people don't believe one syllable words written in fifth grade English is truly a deceived man. Truly. Especially a doctrine that is so clearly taught from Genesis to the end of the book. Now, lest somebody thinks that I now hate dispensationalism, I assure you that I do not. It was rightly dividing the word of truth that enabled me to arrive at the grand and glorious truth of the salvation of all. The most liberating, the most encouraging truth found in the word of God was hidden. It was concealed. I should say it was cleverly hidden by the box I was in. I, was, I remember as I was entering into this liberating truth and thinking to myself, I've been rightly dividing for 17, 18 years, and I know the doctrine. I know rightly dividing doctrine. And I challenged it two years ago when I, Paul wrote to the church of God, which for some reason they don't want to think is the church that he persecuted. Although in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, the church of God that I persecuted, he identifies with church that at the beginning he's writing to. He's not writing to you and me. He's writing to people who believe that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. So, rightly dividing Paul's epistles is as important as rightly dividing it from the rest of the Bible. But, so you need to understand, I understand right division is very important. But, now I'm throwing a but in. Rightly dividing is not the sum total. Rightly dividing is the bare minimum that you need to enter into an understanding of the Word of God. Right division is not an end in itself. You know, as though you found the, the spiritual fountain of youth. No. Right division is the springboard that launches you into the ocean of the Word of God. And that's all it is. A springboard. And that's it. It is not a theological system of biblical interpretation. It is how we can understand the Word of God. Okay? So when I left the box 
or I should say when I broke out of the box and I took the shackles off, I could see the open plains of Saskatchewan, Canada. When I went there once, you can see for miles. I could see the Rockies of Colorado and Utah and Montana. Well, they started in Northwest Canada all the way down to New Mexico, the Rockies. <laughs> I could see the, the peaks, the lofty peaks of the Swiss Alps, Alps. And I could see the clear blue sky above as far as the eye could see. The Bible opened up to me like a flower. You know, you see those, what do you call that? When they, time lapse videos that. <laughs> Man, all of a sudden, this book became clear and brilliant. And the Word of God became more real to me than it had ever before since I had believed the gospel in January of 1984. I'm glad I questioned all of these. I questioned them. And because I questioned them, I left every one of them. Every one. And now the only view of them I have is in my rear view mirror, but before me is the ocean of the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it is. It was only when I saw the word of God in the light of the salvation of all. It's only then that I, and it's only then that you will find the true peace of God and true love for your fellow man. And it was only then that I stopped violating my own conscience. Now let me say this. To any preacher or preachers that will listen to this, and I know there will be some. I could say hi to them all right now and name them all by name. And all of you people that listen to them and all of you people that are listening now, If there is a doctrine in the Word of God that affects your conscience or that discourages you or that produces fear to the point where you have to take antidepressants or you can't sleep or you're concerned about people who've died and, and, and you have this this anxiety inside of you because of a biblical doctrine? When you hear about hellfire and burning for all eternity and in your inmost being, you say to yourself, that does not sound like the God of love that the Bible speaks of. Let me assure you that your conscience is right and the Augustinian preacher you are listening to is wrong. The one who creates that fear and violates your conscience is wrong. If you are reading this or listening to something about what God will do to his created beings that seem so far removed from the God of love that the Bible speaks of, I assure you that you have more common sense than the preacher you are listening to. I promise you that. No rational thinking human being 
who understands the fall of man and who understands what fallen man is capable of can ever receive the doctrine of eternal conscious torment and just smile as though it were the natural expression of a loving heavenly father. If it violates your conscience, which God would never do, if it violates your well-being, then you automatically know it's not of God. It's not of God. It's not right. And these Augustinian preachers that you're listening to, let me tell you something about them. They're not going to back down. They're not going to back down from what they're teaching. You want to know why? Because they're slaves to their theology. They're shackled by their narrative. And they're blinded by their pride, which is evidenced by their refusal to acknowledge one and two. Yeah. They've been teaching their Augustinian theology for so long that they would rather continue in their rhetoric than humble themselves and admit that they've been wrong and begin preaching the truth about God and his plan for his creation. You know what's so amazing about this slide? In every one of these three half-truth systems of biblical interpretation, Throughout my entire preaching history, I've been preaching since I was saved, so <laughs> right? I started preaching three months after I was saved, and I never stopped. I cannot tell you how many times as I was preaching, literally delivering the, the words out of my mouth, as I was speaking, I had a check in my spirit. Like, uh-uh, what did you just say? What did you just say? And it made me question. Whoa, was I right? Was I right? I just cannot believe that that doesn't happen to every preacher who has ever preached the Word of God from a pulpit or from anywhere else, a Bible study, a house study, wherever you are, I cannot believe that has not happened to you in your life. It's sure, I'm sure not the only one this is happening to, or that this has happened to. I know I'm not the only one. But there was a verse in my life. There was a verse that governed a lot of things that I said in my life. And it was John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. He shall know. How? Oh, my goodness. That check in my spirit let me know. I wasn't, it wasn't right. I wasn't saying what was right. But I wanted to do the will of God. I wanted to preach it the right way. If any man will do his will, if any man wants to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That verse is the very first verse when I met Richard Jordan 18, 19 years ago at the first conference I ever went to I sat in his truck with him, and I quoted him that verse and said, this is the verse that governs my life. And he'll know it, and he'll remember it too. And finally, here is a biblical doctrine that when I teach... I have never had a check in my spirit. 
ever. Not once. This doctrine has given me more peace, more love than I've ever experienced in my entire life. Listen to me very carefully, okay? Preachers who get a check in their spirit and people listening to them who get a check in their spirit in the deepest recesses of your being, your knower, your knower knows that something is wrong. You know it's wrong and you're saying it and the people listening to you know it's wrong and they stay there. I want you to remember this. God said, I know for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. God knows. God knows. So when you preachers and the people listening, when you get that check in your spirit and you squash it and you muffle it and you ignore it, and you close your eyes to it, and you continue in the thing that you know is wrong, and the people listening to you continue in the thing that they know is wrong because of the fear of men. Preachers are afraid what other preachers are going to say, and people sitting in your pews are afraid of what you're going to say if they decide to not agree with you. Remember this. God knows. God knows. He knows you had that check in your spirit. He knows you suppressed it. He knows you're lying to yourself. He knows it. And you know it too. You know how I know? Because I'm made of the same thing you are. And if it happened to me, I know it's happening to you. And all these suppress suppressions that you are withholding and, and, and keeping there, they will be brought up before you. They will be brought up before you. And you will give account for those things. David Reed loves to talk about giving account. You're going to give account. So I want to leave you today with these words that every Augustinian preacher believes. Some won't admit it. They won't admit that they believe this because this is hard. What I'm going to put up here is hard. But when you believe that 95% of God's created beings are going to spend eternity burning then somehow, in the back of your mind, this is here. I quote Jonathan Edwards. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. Wow. Strong words to say the least. But if God is sending 95% of his creatures to burn for all of eternity, if this is your theology, then somehow, whether you admit that you believe this or not, this is in your thinking somewhere. Now let me ask you this. With this theology, with these ideas in your head, can you love your neighbor 
like you love yourself. When in your heart you know this is really how God thinks about them. Can you really love them? How consistent is that to this? But I say unto you, this is God. I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That ye may be the children of your Father, which maketh his... For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. That ye may be the children of your father. Does your heavenly father think like this psychotic Augustinian preacher he looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire? Oh, but Brother Rodney, our grace preachers would never think like this. Really? Is that right? How else could you explain what's in their heart when the destination that they have consigned to all humanity is the same destination as this wacko. Is this the same God who gave his son to be the savior of the world? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Is this the same God? This is the God you preach. Oh, sure. He made salvation available. The word available is not even found in your Bible. Mr. King James Preacher, it's not even found. The cross of Jesus Christ is not a billboard saying it's available. The cross of Jesus Christ is a billboard saying it is finished, paid in full. He took it away. He took it away. Now, next week, we're going to look, we're going to look at the men who came before Augustine, those 400 years, what they taught. And then we're going to watch Augustine step onto the scene of church history and change everything for the next 16, 17, 1800, 1900 to years where he encouraged men to put other men to death for disagreeing. As well as John Calvin and others. Something happened in the days of Augustine that explains how today 99% of preachers in Christendom are Augustinianly brainwashed into his theology. You know, that's the beauty. There's a perfect explanation as to why this is in Christendom today. We can actually trace back the Augustinian doctrine and see exactly how it came into being and why. It was so accepted. And now, for the past 150 years, men have seen through. And men are saying, no, 
that is not the picture of God. That is not the picture of the God of the Bible. And what they are preaching is, call it what it is, a lie. It is a lie. Which obviously, I'm not telling anymore. I hate checks in my spirit when I'm preaching. I just despise that. This is what God has done. This is the God of the Bible. And if you don't see it right now, there's a day coming when you will. I've already talked about that numerous times. I'm not going to go over it right now. We're out of time. Jesus Christ died, and he took away. He took away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, thankful that we can look at this Augustinian truth in more detail. I pray that people will be patient as we, as we delve further and deeper into what this man was able to accomplish all by himself. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, folks online, thank you for joining us. And uh, remember, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And also remember that we'll be here next week next Sunday, and uh, take care. Love you all. Have a good week. Try to stay cool.